We are honored today to host our wonderful partner, the Recording Artists Program at Harvard Law School, as they present a musician's guide to copyright law, featuring an introduction to music law, copyrights, performance rights, sampling, and how musicians get paid for their creative endeavors. Here to introduce his colleagues and our three presenting Harvard Law School student scholars is another student scholar himself, Anil Partridge, co-president of the Recording Artists Program at Harvard Law. Anil is a third year student at Harvard Law School and an incoming associate at the New York office of Covington and Burling in the music industry group. Anil completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Toronto, earning an honors BA with high distinction in English and philosophy in 2019. Um, a lifelong classical violinist trained at Canada's Royal Conservatory of Music, Anil worked as a multi-instrumentalist session player before attending law school and continues to play music, primarily jazz. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Anil Partridge. Joanne, thank you so much for introducing me and, uh, and putting on this event. Uh, I, I would like to welcome everyone uh, and kind of briefly introduce the Recording Artist Project uh, uh, and the panel that is with you today. Um, so the Recording Artist Project, uh, we are a student practice organization at Harvard Law School, primarily devoted to uh, offering pro bono legal assistance on music business matters. Um, we originated uh, as a group devoted to uh, serving underserviced uh, music, Boston area musicians, and we've expanded a great deal uh, offering pro bono counsel in such uh, areas as copyright and trademark registration, sample clearance, the negotiation and drafting of contracts related to music production, management, performance, licensing, and much more. Um, and we also operate um, kind of to run community-based events um, uh, on campus for students uh, and public advisory events such as this. Um, uh, you can visit us at the recordingartistproject.com and also contact us at uh, hlsrap at gmail.com. Uh, if you would like our services uh, or to, to book an event with us. Um, I will repeat this info at the end. Um, today, we have a fantastic panel of students uh, and I'll just introduce them. Um, so uh, we have Andrew Rodriguez, um, uh, a recent addition to our board, uh, the co-director of events at the Recording Artist Project. Andrew is currently a second year law student at Harvard Law School where he recently joined the board um, of the Recording Artist Project. Uh, he received a bachelor's degree in music from Columbia uh, one of his favorite memories from college uh, is playing in the Columbia Jazz Band, um, uh, Columbia Jazz Ensembles. Uh, after graduating from college, uh, Andrew spent time working at Concord Music and Dentsu, both in New York. Uh, he hopes to work in the entertainment field, um, in entertainment law, uh, so that he can combine his love of music with his interest in the law. Um, we also have Landon Harris with us, who is the communications director of the Recording Artist Project. Landon Harris is a second year law student at Harvard Law School. Um, he is also a member of the Committee on Sports and Entertainment Law and has served as a team leader for the Harvard Law Entrepreneurship Project and is actively involved in the Harvard Black Law Students Association. This summer, he worked at O'Melveny and Myers LLP in Century City, California, where he continued to cultivate an interest in the intersection between music, entertainment, and transactional law. Landon graduated from the University of Southern California in 2019 with a degree in business administration and emphasis in marketing. And finally, we have Jiha Min, our intake director. Uh, Jiha is a rising 2L at Harvard Law School with a strong interest in entertainment law and corporate transactional work. Before attending law school, she worked as a corporate paralegal for two years in New York City. Jiha is currently working as a business affairs and legal intern at Marvel Studios. Uh, today, as Joanne mentioned, we're going to give you kind of an uh, overview of relevant copyright law for musicians. Um, we began doing this last year and we found it to be just a fantastic opportunity to um, bring some of our education uh, in a public advisory capacity to uh, help clear up some often confusing concepts uh, uh, and, um, and explain them in a very practical way. Uh, and also we'll be discussing some emerging legal issues in the music industry uh, that may be of particular interest to musicians, um, uh, especially uh, who may have fears about uh, liability and increasing cost of sample-based music. 
uh, and also ways to monetize uh, their catalog. Uh, so without further ado, I think I will pass the mic off to Jiha to begin our, our talk today. Thank you very much, Anil, and thank you, Joanne, um, for inviting us here. So yeah, as written in our panel description and as Anil introduces us in the first segment of this presentation, we'll be going over the basics of how you as a musician can monetize your copyright. And broadly speaking, there are two streams of copyright in music law, one for composers and another for performers. In this first segment, I'll be going over how composers can earn money from your copyright. Next slide, please. Thank you. So you've written a song. How can you monetize that? So as a songwriter, you own a copyright to your musical composition, which means that you control who uses it, sells it, listens to it. And the main way you can monetize your copyright is by collecting royalties from letting other people use your song. These allowances are called licenses. And in order to collect these royalties, there are a few main services you must register with as a songwriter. If you have a publisher, they would, of course, do this registration for you. The first one is a performing rights organization, also called a PRO. A PRO collects your performance royalties. I'll describe more in depth about what these are later on. The second one is the Harry Fox Agency, or the HFA. They collect the mechanical royalties. And the third is a relatively new organization called the Mechanical Licensing Collective, or the MLC. This is a new organization that was created by the Music Modernization Act, which was just passed last year. Next slide, please. Thank you. So first things first, the PRO. A PRO collects your performance royalties, which are royalties you earn when your music is heard on TV, played in a bar, played in restaurants, anytime it's performed publicly. And there are three main PROs in the Americas. One is ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. As you can see on the left side uh, yellow box of the chart right there. It is important to note that as a songwriter, you can only register for one PRO. You cannot register for all three and collect royalties from all three. Sadly, you can only register for one. And as a songwriter, you need to register as to be paid for the writer's share of the performance royalties. If you have a music publisher, they would sign up to receive the publisher shares of the royalties. Now, if you don't have a music publisher, then you have to register yourself as also the publisher to receive both the writer and the publisher shares of the performance royalties there. The share distribution ratio is usually 50-50, but depending on what kind of arrangement you have with your individual publisher, that would of course change. It is important to note that you also have to register each individual song with a PRO. Otherwise, it won't be in their database and you won't be able to collect the royalties when your songs are performed. So what does a PRO do with your song? The main thing they do is issue blanket licenses. This gives companies that play live music like restaurants, radio or TV stations, webcasters, the right to play any music in that PRO's catalog, including your own. The PRO then tracks all of these live performances of your songs and then uses that to determine what share of the royalties will go to you versus another songwriter or all this, any songwriter in their catalog. The second important organization you must register with is the HFA or the Harry Fox Agency. You can find that in the yellow box in the middle of the chart. The Harry Fox Agency collects mechanical royalties, not performance royalties. A mechanical royalty is paid when someone buys a copy of your song or streams your song. And there's a different rate set by the government for CD sales versus streaming music, downloading ringtones, etc. And just like a PRO, an HFA issues mechanical licenses to people, collects the royalties from them, and distributes it to the rights holders. A very new organization now is the Mechanical Licensing Collective. So this is very recent, and as you can see, it has not yet been added to the chart. So the MLC was created through the Music Modernization Act and is a nonprofit organization intended to benefit both streaming services as well as you as copyright holders. 
So previously, if Spotify or Apple Music wanted to stream a song, they could obtain a, what is called a compulsory license from the Copyright Office, and they would have to do this on a song by song basis. The compulsory license is pretty similar to a mechanical license with a couple caveats. One, you can obtain a compulsory license without actually getting permission from the copyright holder. So as long as you pay the statutory fee, you are allowed to stream the song. The second is that you cannot change the basic melody or fundamental nature of the song. So you can do minor arrangements, but you can't change too much. Otherwise, the copyright holder can come in and take away the license from you. The third is that this is only for non-dramatic works. So if you're talking about a overture to an opera, for example, that would not be covered by a compulsory license. And of course, if you don't want to get a compulsory license and pay that statutory fee, you can just go to the copyright owner and uh, negotiate for your own rate. So those individual uh, negotiations are completely allowed. What the MLC does is now create a centralized database of all copyright holders. So Spotify and Apple Music, instead of requesting a compulsory license on a song by song basis, now gets a blanket license that covers all the songs in the MLC's catalog, which is great for Spotify because it makes it much easier for them to uh, legally stream the songs uh, with a proper license, but it also makes it easier for you as songwriters to collect copy, uh, to collect the royalties since everything is centralized. The MLC database is also publicly available so you can go in and check to see who owns which copyright yourself. If you're wondering how this conflicts with the HFA, um, to note the MLC only really governs streaming uses. So if you're talking about sales like CD sales, LP sales, all of that is still managed by the HFA and the HFA has the power to kind of collect those royalties and still distribute them to you. The HFA is also the primary vendor for the MLC. So they've been very crucial in helping get this organization going. A couple of final notes in the MLC include that it is not a PRO. So it won't affect your performing rights royalties at all. The MLC is also free to join and take 0% commission. I believe the PROs and HFA take about a 12% commission off your royalties just to keep their going. The MLC takes 0%. What is most important is that the MLC is not a replacement for registering your work with the Copyright Office. If someone ever infringes upon your copyright and you need to seek statutory damages in court, you can only do that if your work is registered also with the Copyright Office. So please do so. To recap generally, the two main sources of royalties for songwriters come from performance royalties and mechanical royalties. In order to collect your performance royalties, you must register with a PRO. In order to collect your mechanical royalties, you must register with the HFA and with the MLC. Now the system is a bit different when it comes to recording artists. And now Andrew will talk about copyright as it relates to the sound recordings. Thanks, Jiha. Uh, so uh, before I, Again, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that you're free to post questions in the chat if you want, and um, we'll, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can at the end of, of the presentation. Uh, so um, I'll be talking to you about sound recording copyrights. As Jiha mentioned before, uh, the United States legal system splits music copyrights into two pieces, one being the songwriting publishing part that Jiha just went through, the other one being the sound recording or master recording part that I'm about to go through. The sound recording part gets its own separate copyright. Um, and so it can be a little weird to think about it sometimes, but um, there can be many uh, different recordings of any one song and each one of those recordings would have its own copyright. For example, think of covers, right? There can be countless recordings of any one song each one of those would have its own copyright. Think of uh, re-recordings, right? Like uh, Taylor Swift, who recently re-recorded a bunch of her old, um, a bunch of her old tracks from earlier in her in her career. Each of those new recordings has its own copyright. 
um, or think of things like like alternative takes, um, right? A, a recording that an artist decided was not going to go on on an album, but maybe it gets released at a later time. That recording has its own separate copyright. So while one composition might only have that one copyright, you might end up with you know many many different recordings with many many different copyrights that need to be kept track of. Now the rights associated with uh, these sound recording copyrights are basically the same as those for songs, with a few exceptions um, that we will be going through. Um, the main idea is still the same and that the copyright owner has the right to say how and when the recording can be exploited. Uh, so I'll be running through how recording artists can exploit their sound recording copyrights. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I will mention that if you sign a, a record deal with a label, they'll be involved with all this and, and taking care of a lot of it for you. Um, uh, if you do not have a label deal, you'll have to do this, most of this on your own. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to go through are physical sales and downloads, relatively not that common these days, right? Certainly not, not as popular. Uh, the idea is fairly straightforward, right? You are exchanging a copy of a sound recording for money, right? You give away a CD with copies of your sound recording in exchange for however much, right? Uh, you give away a download of uh, an MP3 download of a copy of your sound recording for however much, right? And so it's just a this for that type of, uh, of exchange. Uh, and that's how one way that that copyright can be exploited. The second uh, category, which is definitely far more um, far more relevant to, to 2021 is, is streaming, right? This is Spotify, Apple Music, a bunch of others. In this case, it's not as simple as a, you know, here's a copy of my copyright, now please give me a set amount of money. You are essentially allowing the streaming platforms to let users listen to your sound recording in exchange for a not clear amount of money. The exact formula that these platforms use <clears throat> that these platforms use to to come to however money you're going to get paid is not um, you know totally transparent. Um, it has to do with uh, if the you know how many times do your uh, how many times does your recording get listened to? Uh, was the person that listened to it a free user? Were they a paid user? Uh, there's a lot of different factors that go into it. Some of the platforms, a lot of the platforms differ in how they calculate it. So it's very hard um, to tell from an outside perspective on how that works. But again, that is another way that a uh, sound recording artists will exploit those copyrights. Indie artists can use music aggregators like TuneCore to make sure that their recordings get put on you know, all the major platforms instead of you, know, you having to go to every single one. And already, you know, it seems like I've mentioned a bunch of different things and indie artists do have to kind of keep track of this all on their own uh, and, and make sure that their recordings are being put on all the platforms that you're keeping track of the revenue coming in from all of these platforms. If you sign a record deal, um, right, you are either giving up the ownership to your copyrights in exchange for the label, uh, you know, doing everything for you and giving you royalties, or maybe you're licensing it to them, right? So you keep your copyright, but you're letting a label control the copyright for a set amount of time, like five, 10, 20 years, whatever it might be, right? So these are all things that you can think about, right? Either you can, can, treat, you can keep all the ownership and all the control um, and manage everything yourself, or you can uh, give up some of that ownership or some of that control and not have to manage it all on yourself. These are things that um, you need to take into account when making those decisions. Um, next up are sync deals. Um, if a recording is used in, uh, along with any type of video format, right? So if it's used in like 
a commercial or a TV show or a movie, something like that, a special license is needed, uh, which is called a synchronization license. Uh, please note that this type of license is needed for both the sound recording and for the song. So every time that uh, one of these is, is used in any one of these videos, both sides need to be covered. Um, if you own both, that's cool because now you're getting you know, two sources of revenue. Um, these can be pretty lucrative at times. Um, labels and distributors, if you have a deal with one of them, uh, will, will commonly pitch your music to be included in, in commercials and movies and stuff because um, it, it's good for them too, right? They take a cut of that sync, of that sync revenue. And then finally, what I'd like to talk about uh, on this part is something called neighboring rights. This is, some, this is a less obvious aspect of uh, sound recording copyright exploitation. Uh, Jihad, Jihad mentioned that uh, in the US, these PROs collect royalties for public performance royalties uh, from things like uh, radio stations when um, uh, you, your music gets played on, on, like, uh, on cable channels, when music gets played in restaurants, et cetera. In the US, there is not an equivalent royalty for sound recording copyright owners, right? Um, if a sound recording gets played on terrestrial radio, the owner of that sound recording copyright does not get any money. The radio stations get to do that for free. They have to pay the songwriters, but they do not have to pay the performers. There's one exception to this, which is digital transmission, um, which basically covers satellite radio, uh, like Sirius XM, and internet radio, like Pandora. Um, the equivalent to the PRO <clears throat> uh, in this case is a company called Sound Exchange. So yet another thing that you should be signing up for. They will collect these, these royalties from places like Sirius and from, from Pandora and distribute it out to their users. Um, another uh, advantage is that they will also collect places from, they'll collect royalties from uh, other countries as well. So you might be able to, to be getting some extra revenue uh, for territories that Sound Exchange has, has deals with. Everything that I'm mentioning uh, probably does sound kind of overwhelming at this point if you're new to all of this, because um, not only has Jiha mentioned at least three different things that uh, indie artists need to sign up with in order to keep track and collect all the revenue that they're owed. Now I'm throwing in, you know, two or three more things. Do your best to take it, you know, one at a time and eventually you will get used to it. Uh, you'll get the hang of it and be able to, to keep track of all this stuff because making sure that all of these points are covered um, is the best way to maximize your revenue. Uh, now, can I go to the next slide, please? All right, so um, this, will, this is a, a smaller aspect of this. I wanted to cover a few other types of IP that are separate from the sound recording copyrights. Music videos. Um, this is a relatively minor point in that music videos are usually only used as, as promo material, right? People aren't really selling music videos, really. Um, the video itself is covered under a separate copyright, right? So in certain instances, if you wrote the song and you're the performer on the recording and you're the one that made the video, you now own three different copyrights and you'd be able to control each and every one of them, how and when they're used. Uh, the next thing, which I think is something that is not talked about as often as it should be, which is name, image, and likeness and endorsements. Artists can use their names, their images, and their likenesses to help market brands. Um, think of this as you know, big endorsements, like uh, big ad campaigns with TV commercials and, and billboards and stuff like that, or even much smaller type of campaigns where maybe it's just a few Instagram posts talking about 
a new product or a new a new service that a brand is giving out, something like that. Um, usually, people need to have a sizable following in order to get these types of these types of deals in the first place. But it's important to remember that once you get to the point where um, something like that is possible, you are in control of the way that your name, your image, and your likeness are used, um, particularly in commercial settings. And so, uh, I, yet again, something to keep track of, but the knowledge that you have control over that and that you should be compensated appropriately for the use of that is important to have because you don't want other parties to be exploiting that when you're not, you know, uh, when you don't agree with them on, on when and how it should be exploited. Um, now, the last thing that I wanted to say is there are a lot of um, aspects of this business that no one has even thought of yet, and we don't know exactly how they will fit into the law. Um, for example, a lot of legal uh, music contrast, contracts talk about, they, they include language that's something along the lines of like, you know, this will cover any medium uh, that might come about in the future that hasn't even been thought of yet. Right. And so that's always something to keep in mind. Uh, and actually, Landon, who will be presenting a little later, um, will touch on an example of one of these emerging areas. And um, we'll discuss a little bit about how uh, the law would interact with such a thing. Um, so thank you. And now back to Jiha to discuss sampling and fair use. Thanks, Andrew. So with all the copyrights that songwriters, recording artists have, a very common question that comes up is sampling. So sampling is when you use pieces of someone else's music. Could I actually go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So whether sampling delves into copyright infringement territory, the answer is it depends on each time. So under the copyright law, you as the copyright holder have the following rights, the reproduction, creation of derivative works, distribution, public performance, public display, and digital transmission of your works. Next slide, please. Thank you. So sampling, as you can probably imagine, infringes upon the copyright holder's exclusive right to reproduce their work and create derivative works. If you're also performing the sampled music in public, you would also be theoretically infringing upon their exclusive right to public performance. So in order to use the sampled music legally, what you must do is something called sample clearance. Clearing your sample means obtaining permission from the owners of the sampled music to use it in your own music. If you don't clear your sample, however, all is not lost as you could still claim a defense and not be held liable. The two common copyright infringement defenses are de minimis and fair use. Next slide, please. So the first one is de minimis. It is literally about small things. And the main question course will ask is, can the average listener recognize that this piece of music came from someone else's song? It might seem simple at first, but the problem is not all courts agree on whether this is allowed or not. So the Sixth Circuit Court, for example, says that sampling is never allowed. In a very famous court case called Bridgeport versus Dimension Films, the court wrote, get a, sample, get a license or do not sample, and that's it. Versus the Ninth Circuit, where it does allow for the de minimis defense, where if the average listener can't recognize it, then the court will let it go. So depending on which state, which court you're in, um, even when sampling the same piece of music, in one court you could be held liable, in another you wouldn't. Next slide, please. Another defense um, often invoked is called fair use. So fair use has four factors that the courts look at and they're all interrelated. The first is the purpose or character of your use. As you can imagine, a court would be amenable towards educational purposes as opposed to commercial purposes. 
So when you're using a song for teaching, news reporting, uh, music criticism, any of those kind of programs, of course, we'll generally find that to be fair use. The second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work. This relates not so much to music, but for example, um, if we're taking books or literary works, if you're copying a part of a non-fictional work, that will probably fall under fair use because those are just facts. There's not much creativity involved versus fiction, music, songs. Those will generally not be covered by fair use because the whole point of copyright is to protect creative endeavors and um, so the courts will look to that. The third is the amount and substantiality of the portion taken. This kind of goes back to de minimis as we talked about because courts will generally find taking an entire chorus of a song to be more offensive than taking a one second clip, for example. The fourth is the effect of the use upon the potential market of the original song. This also ties back to, for example, the purpose and character of your use. If you're using a song just for research purposes or for educational purposes, not only is it not probably going to affect the market for the original song, but it's also hard to track if the market is affected at all versus if you copy an entire stanza or an entire chorus, copy it into your song, it's probably easier to track how that song is going to affect the potential market for the original and also um, have the adverse, affect, the adverse effects that the original copyright holder would not want. So as you can see at the chart, the line graph at the bottom, a license sample, a sample where you got full permission from the copyright holder, is legally pretty safe. You probably won't get into any trouble from using that. A little more risky, but still probably safe, is a brief clip of a song for a nonprofit music criticism show. It's nonprofit, um, so it's not for um, to commercial purposes. And it's also a music criticism show, so it has some educational purpose there. A little more risky is a full length parodic imitation of a song. The full length is a little debatable because you're taking the entire song instead of just a little clip. And depending on what kind of parody or what kind of satirical spin you're putting on it, the course could go back and forth on whether it was truly fair use or not. And what's really legally risky, and you probably shouldn't do, is sample a completely unedited, untransformed, unlicensed 45 second hook of a song. So to conclude, please clear your samples before using them in your work and just be careful about infring potentially infringing upon other people's copyright as you're vigilant about protecting your own. Now, on a much more exciting note, Landon will now be discussing some emerging issues in music law right now and legal considerations that you should be keeping in mind going forward. Thanks, Jiha and Andrew for providing that copyright law overview. So as you begin to familiarize yourself with the basics of copyright law, it may also be good to follow along with emerging issues and new revenue sources related to the copyrights you have over your music. So next slide, please. So two issues that I'll be discussing are one, NFTs as a new potential revenue source for artists, as well as some high profile litigation cases involving copyright that have good holdings to be paying attention to when thinking about your own copyrights. Next slide, please. First, NFTs. So in the wake of COVID-19 and the elimination of live performance opportunities, many artists have extra incentive just to seek out new sources of revenue. And NFTs are a great emerging technology for artists to key into to think about monetizing and promoting their music on. So what are NFTs? An NFT is essentially a digital asset that represents a real world object like art, music, videos. They're bought and sold online frequently with cryptocurrency because they use the same sort of technology that crypto uses to store information. Um, so NFT stands for non-fungible token. And 
Non-fungible is just a fancy word that means an item is unique and it can't be exchanged or replaced with something that is exactly the same. A good way of thinking about NFTs is just as a collector's item only in the digital world. So instead of getting an actual painting to hang on a wall or a vinyl to record to spin, a buyer would be getting a digital file that represents that piece of art instead. It may be weird to think of a digital file as something that has significant value, but NFTs are really just another piece of content that musicians can look to provide for their fans. This may include developing mixed media pieces, overlaying your music on top of unique digital images, creating digital art installations to promote the release of new music, or even releasing uh, some limited copies of one's music as NFTs themselves. Uh, there are several benefits to using NFTs specifically as a revenue source. Um, the first being just that because NFTs are pretty unique, you can be pretty creative with the type of content and experiences that you're offering your fans. Artists have a lot of flexibility over the items they want to auction off at, as NFTs. As I mentioned, albums, digital art, sound bites, even merchandise are all forms of NFTs that musicians are exchanging currently. And fans are often excited and happy to receive a rare experience and may be willing to pay more of a premium to gain ownership over them. The second major benefit of NFTs is just that there are no middlemen involved in the transaction. So as many of you know, may know, when a fan buys an album or streams a song, some of that money obviously goes to the artist, but a lot may go to the streaming platform or the record company that represents the artist as well. Since NFT transactions are direct transfers between participants, uh, when selling an NFT, the artist would get the money, the fan gets the content, and there are no middlemen involved making it more of a streamlined process to obtaining revenue. Uh, another benefit in the revenue generation aspect of NFTs is the fact that they have perpetual royalties. So. After an original transaction, certain platforms also allow artists to get a guaranteed share of any secondary market sales of their work. Um, this pretty much just means that the creator of the NFT receives a percentage every time that NFT is sold or changes hands, making sure that if you create an NFT that becomes particularly popular or balloons in value, if that work is sold again, you would still get a percentage of that secondary sale. Now, there are a couple legal considerations to keep in mind when discussing NFTs and um, how artists can use them. First, as it relates to copyright, it's particularly important to note that the creator of the NFT is the owner of the intellectual property rights of its content. So if a seller of an NFT created its content, the seller has all the copyrights to that content contained in the NFT. The buyer, however, is only um, the only rights that the buyer really has is to own, sell, lend, or transfer the NFT itself. Buying an NFT does not mean that the copyright to the artwork transfers to the buyer. And the situation is essentially the same as if you were buying a CD. So if you were to buy a CD, you're buying a physical copy of the music, not the ability to create new works that wholly or substantially reproduce the music within it. Uh, the same can be said of NFTs you're buying the NFT and you have the ability to own and sell it, but you do not have the copyrights of the content that is contained within the NFT. The other pretty big legal issue to take into consideration when thinking about NFTs relates to the royalties I specifically uh, speak about before. So written in the code of a lot of NFTs is a smart contract that allows for automatic royalty payments to the creator each time the work is resold. However, these automatic resale royalty payments only kick in uh, if the NFT is resold through the same platform that the original transaction took place on. Since US copyright law does not currently recognize resale royalty rights as an automatic thing that goes to the creator, if an NFT is sold on a different platform and those, uh, the smart code does not kick in, the law doesn't necessarily provide a recourse for that unpaled, uh, unparalleled uh, resale royalty right. Because of this, it's just important to think about which platform you wanna uh, auction off an NFT on because 
the subsequent royalties that you may receive from that NFT may be dependent on subsequent sales on that very same platform. Next slide, please. So in addition to NFTs, I also wanted to discuss some high profile litigation cases involving copyrights from the past couple of years. Um, the first case is between uh, Nicki Minaj and singer songwriter Tracy Chapman. So last year, Nicki Minaj had to pay a pretty hefty $450,000 settlement uh, to deal with the copyright dispute that she had with uh, Tracy Chapman. Pretty much Chapman sued Minaj for copyright infringement back in 2018 over a song called Sorry uh, that Minaj um, had produced. And this song borrowed heavily from Chapman's Baby Can I Hold You from 1988. Um, the aspect of this case that drew particular attention was that this Nicki Minaj song was not actually officially released, but had rather been just played on the radio by a um, celebrity DJ who you may be familiar with, Funkmaster Flex. Um, the dispute here raised some pretty interesting questions of one, whether artists can be liable for unreleased works that are still in progress, and two, whether they need permission to even experiment with copyrighted works in the studio. Uh, as Gia discussed, um, Minaj used a fair use defense, arguing that her creation of Sorry, since it was experimental, was uh, a fair use, uh, even without the license from Chapman. And even though Minaj ended up paying a settlement, it was on this issue that the United States District Court in Los Angeles actually sided with Minaj, holding that to um, rule against this would uproot the common practice of allowing artists to experiment privately and doing such would also limit creativity, stifling innovation in the music industry. So Minaj actually still had to pay money to Chapman because the judge allowed the case to go to trial over the question of how the song made it to Funkmaster Flex. Um, if Minaj had leaked the song herself or authorized its release indirectly, she would be li liable for significant penalties. Um, and this is what ultimately led to the settlement payment. As a musician, the takeaway from this case should mainly just be that you have permission to experiment with copyrighted material and your creative process, but the derivative of works that you may create from such experimentation cannot be officially released or intentionally leaked without um, it being a copyright infringement. So another major case from the past year was in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a court that governs California and many of the West Coast states. Um, this case found that Led Zeppelin did not infringe on a 1968 song called Taurus by the band Spirit in its creation of its hit, Stairway to Heaven. The Zeppelin case began way back in 2014, actually, after it was alleged that the opening instrumental riff of the song Stairway to Heaven lifted several notes from 19, uh, Spirit's 1968 song, Taurus. In finding that uh, Led Zeppelin did not actually infringe on Spirit's copyright, the Ninth Circuit uh, Court overturned a rule that was previously known as the inverse ratio rule when it comes to copyright infringement. So in most copyright infringement cases, an artist must show one, that the infringement, uh, that the infringer had access to the work and two, that the works were substantially similar. The inverse ratio rule worked um, in saying that if more access is shown, less similarity is necessary to establish infringement. Here, the rule actually got overturned because the concept of access has changed pretty tremendously in the digital age, as millions of works are readily available on YouTube, Spotify, all of the streaming platforms that we use. Since such works are so easily accessible now, the inverse ratio rule no longer really makes sense because it would establish an unreasonably lower standard for similarity um, in order to make an infringement case. In Spirit's case, like I mentioned before, it was only several notes lifted and the, the similarity in dispute was not substantial enough to really warrant an infringement case despite Spirit Song being widely accessible. And the takeaway from this case to remember is just that 
in this digital age where we have so much access to um, wide amounts of music, increased accessibility does not lower any burden for proving similarity in all copyright infringement cases. Next slide, please. So that broadly covers the kind of copyright basics and emerging issues we wanted to share with you all, but I'll now open it up to some questions that had been um, given in the chat and we'll see how many we can answer. Thank you. Hello, so uh, uh, one question that we had was um, uh, to discuss licensing songs for use in podcasts, which is an interesting use case. I believe Andrew is going to answer. Hi everyone. So the process for music licensing when it comes to podcasts is somewhat similar to the process that one would take when licensing music for video. Um, just like uh, a person who's making a TV show or a movie or something that they would go out and get a license <clears throat> from the owner of the sound recording and from the owner of the song, someone who's producing a podcast should do the same, right? Reach out to both the owner of the sound recording and to the owner of the song and get licenses from both. Um, there are, you know, uh, considerations about fair use, right? So everything that G had talked about can apply to this, where depending on the nature of the podcast, you, it, it would be more or less likely that, that um, uh, a, a license would happen, right? Uh, a very, very commercial podcast that, you know, is clearly, you know, making money through ad revenue and stuff like that um, would be very wise to go out and get all the proper licenses from all the copyright owners. Someone who's, you know, doing a not-for-profit type of thing um, might be on that, you know, other side of the spectrum, but however, you know, it, it, it's all a judgment call, right? If you want to be as safe as possible, you always want to get all the clearances, um, you know, all the clearances that, that, that uh, you possibly can get. And from the musician point of view, right, if, um, someone is, uh, if, if you hear your music on, on someone's podcast or if someone's asking you about it, right? Remember, this is something that, this is a copyright that you control. It's something that you, you can say when and how it's being used for the most part. So just remember that, keep that in mind um, and, and do your best to, to bring in as much revenue as you can. Thanks, Andrew. Um, one, one thing to mention also, uh, just as kind of Jiha was discussing, fair use can be an important consideration. Um, uh, it's often claimed by uh, podcast producers. Um, uh, there are no hard and fast rules, as we discussed, and you know you can reach out to us if you, if you want further, more specific uh, counsel on a particular use case of a particular composition and sound recording. Um, but uh, the standard uh, rules we discussed for fair use would would apply to that. Using that defense, relying on that defense to uh, incorporate a, a musical work or sound recording into a podcast. So another question that we had. Um, was uh, relating to distribution deals. We had a few questions to do with this. So uh, one is, um, does a distribution deal prevent the original rights holder from exploiting their own copyright rights um, in a musical work or sound recording? And I believe it was Jiao that was going to answer this question. I, th I think it was me again. Was that you as well? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when it comes to distribution deals, um, it depends on the specifics of whichever deal you are talking about uh, at, any, at any one point, right? You'd have to look at the agreement and see what terms you, you agree to. <clears throat> but uh, in certain instances, right, if you do like a distribution deal with like a major label, for example, in a lot of instances, they'll take um, ownership of it, or at least they'll take a license for, you know, a certain amount of time. In that case, that does limit what you can do um, uh, with that copyright, right? It might not even be yours at that point, or you might have, you know, licensed it out to the other party. In other 
types of dist distribution deals. For example, if you're using an aggregator like TuneCore, that's a type of distribution deal. In an instance like that, you're just saying, hey, I'm going to pay you a fee. You're going to put my music on all of these different music platforms. And that's it, right? They don't own your music. They have no other control over the, over the music, uh, you know, other than they put it on the platforms that, that, that you want. So there is no limit on uh, how you can use your copyright. So it depends on what type of deal you're talking about. There's a lot of variety. You'd have to just kind of um, check the terms of each deal to see what the specifics would be. Okay, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, another question that we had is uh, when it comes to licensing, uh, where does the Copyright Office at the Library of Congress enter the picture? Um, sure, so I can handle that one. Uh, the Copyright Office is still in existence. The MLC is related to the Copyright Office in that the board members of the MLC, some of them come from the Copyright Office. However, it is a separate entity that you must also register with. So the Copyright Office is there if you need compulsory licenses, of, um, as discussed earlier, but more importantly than that, if someone ever infringes upon your copyright and you wanna take them to court to uh, regain the damages that you're owed, if your work is not registered with the Copyright Office, you cannot recover damages. This is separate from having a copyright in itself because as soon as you create something, you do own a copyright to that. But you, if you ever want to get legal remedy from the use of your copyright, then it must be registered with the Copyright Office. Otherwise, you won't be able to um, get the statutory damages that you are owed. So whatever you do, please always just register your music with the Copyright Office. It can only uh, do you good in the long run. Okay, uh, one question was kind of a, a review. Uh, what are the two copyrights for sync licenses? Again, sound recording and uh, I think this question is for Andrew. So the two copyrights are one for uh, the song or the publishing side and the other being the sound recording or the master side. And one clarification that I wanted to make from when I was speaking in uh, previously, uh, when I said sync licenses, usually uh, that, only refers to the song or the publishing side of it. When um, we're talking about sound recordings being used, you know, in on with a video, it's usually called a master use license. Um, the idea is the same, right? You're just licensing for the 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 right to put that into the video. But the they do, you know, different nomenclature. So just I don't want anyone to get confused if if they hear another term being used. Um, so sound recording side they usually say master use license. For the publishing side, they usually say sync license. So another question on the licensing side uh, is, uh, should a composer join a PRO, Harry Fox Agency, and the Mechanical Licensing Collective all at the same time? Uh, yes, so because each organization deals with different sort of royalties, if you don't join, for example, a PRO, then you probably won't be able to collect any of the royalties from performance rights. And if you don't join the HFA, you probably won't be able to collect any of the royalties you get from mechanical licenses. So only by joining all three organizations do you really cover the whole um, gambit and get all the revenue that you are justly deserved. So one question um, from the chat addressed uh, to if someone incorporated uh, a portion of another song within the chorus of their own song, um, it, would they need to seek permissions to do that? Um, and uh, so I think a few uh, things are worth mentioning. Um, there will, there may, if, if the portion used incorporates lyrics, there may be a copyright in the lyrics. Um, the portion used uh, may incorporate a more than de minimis portion of the composition. Um, you, you know, certainly then you would need permission um, in the form of a license or just free permission uh, from the relevant rights holder to use that. Um, interpolations, uh, you know, may, it may be more difficult if you use a large enough portion of the composition or sound recording to make a good fair use claim for an interpolation. Uh, and there's no kind of special licensing regime for it. 
Um, it's interesting. I mean, you hear many examples of this in in, the, in music today. I'm thinking of a uh, White Ferrari by Frank Ocean incorporates a portion of uh, uh, a song off of Revolver by the Beatles. Um, and, uh, and you know, permissions had to had to be sought for that. Um, otherwise, it could infringe the derivative works right, reproduction right, um, uh, and possibly other 106 rights. Um, I believe there are further questions. Um, do, do any other of the board members participating today have any uh, any questions that they received directly that they uh, they'd like to address now? Okay, then uh, then with that, uh, we would like to conclude. Uh, Thank you, Joanne and, and Mondo, and, and to all of the attendees uh, for, for coming today. And thank you so much to our panelists for their, their hard work on this presentation today. We hope that it was useful to you, um, informative, and, uh, and uh, we would like to, again, just let you know that we are uh, available for, for intake uh, for new clients uh, beginning this fall. Um, our email is displayed on the screen, rap at law.harvard.edu, and that's our website there, recordingartistproject.com. Feel free to reach out to any one of us individually or, or this email uh, and fill out the intake form on our website and we would be happy to help if we can. Uh, and you can find us on Instagram as Chris noted in the chat at, at Harvard Rap. Um, so with that, thank you very much. And I'd love to pass it back to Joanne. Thank you, Anil. Thank you everybody for an incredible panel today. Um, special thanks to rap at Harvard Law School, um, the entire team, our panelists, Jiha, Andrew, Landon, Anil, as well as Chris, Chris Zhang for all of your help. And thanks to all of you for sharing your afternoon with us. And please keep an eye out for our invitation to our next Zoom two weeks from now on August 14th, when Mondo and Hi-Fi present a new episode of the Future of Financial Rights. And we hope to see all of you at Mondo in New York in October, either in person in New York City or online when, Ron, when RAP and Mondo will once again present our third annual pro bono session series for independent artists. In the meantime, everybody, please stay well, stay safe, and enjoy the rest of the summer. And we'll see you in October.